waiting till the last. I think I know it's a long day, and I'm the. I'm the last batsman, so I know I got a lot of some. Maybe I, I think I got a probably five or six balls and a lot many runs to make. So I'll make my best, make sure that uh, you'll be entertained for next 20, 25 minutes. So basically, wh what is this clinical ultrasound is about? So it's essentially what I'm going to talk about is why somebody should use the ultrasound in routine clinical practice. That's what the whole article is about, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So essentially, that's my disclosure. So that's my hospital. I come from Brisbane. So I used to work in Pune till 2007. In the last 10 years, I'm in Brisbane. So before I start, I think probably just spend some few seconds. I'll leave you guys to read this slide from the Indian perspective law. So you have to make sure that you will be actually obeying this all the related paperwork and a law from the Indian perspective. So whatever, fortunately, unfortunately, I don't work here, so it doesn't apply to me, but I think it's very relevant to your practice. So to uh, start with uh, one of the quote, none other than the Swami Vivekanand, that's probably a new idea is first condemned as ridiculous and dismissed as a trivial until finally it becomes what everybody knows. So if you see the journey of echocardiography, we started with the M mode, which is from 1956 all the way up to the 3D, which has been launched in 1997. So if you see, the Dr. Kurlgan, he's the one first cardiac anesthetist in San Francisco in 1984, first to use the transesophageal echocardiography for hemodynamic monitoring. And that's how we started the whole journey of ultrasonography or echocardiography in anesthetic practice. So that's my article came last month in the uh, Indian Journal of Anesthesia, where actually I've been described the whole journey of our ultrasonography. So can we use it in the cardiac surgery? So obviously not, but there are some of the indications, bedside indications, where you can use this ultrasonography, whether it's a transthoracic, heart, or lung, or other majors, before the procedure or after the procedure. So hypoxia, yes, we can diagnose few of the conditions which can be possibly diagnosed with the help of transthoracic echocardiography or even the ultrasonography of lung on the bedside. So essentially, this is what the fact was when the whole the journey of stethoscope started about a few years back. And the so whole thing was based on the subjective analysis of stethoscope. So transthoracic in anesthesia, it's been, you can see, it's, everybody started using emergency medicine, radiology, cardiology. And wh what's the difference between the transesophageal and a transthoracic? Exactly, the images are upside down, nothing else. So if you know the two images, you can do a transthoracic. Very simple, easy to learn, and got a short learning curve. So this is one of the paper which has come in 2011 in the point of, as a point of care ultrasonography or POC clinical ultrasound in a New England journal, and that's changed the whole practice of anesthesia and ultrasonography. So what's the advantage? You can see, you don't need anybody. You don't need a cardiologist, you don't need a scientist, you don't need anybody. If you know how to do it, you can do it on your own. So what it actually helps in guides in acute care decision making. So what's the aim and objective of this point of care ultrasonography? It's a limited, it can be done in the point of care, and its aim and objective is not to replace a conventional transthoracic or whatever you call as a standard practice done by the cardiologist in the lab practice. So obviously, what essentially it helps, you can make a nice rapport with the patients in addition to the make a better informed management decision. And on top of that, this is the landmark. Another paper come in the Journal of American Society of Echocardiography. So they talk about a focused cardiac ultrasound, which is came in 2013. I think that was essentially the most important paper which helps, talks about all the possible guidelines related to the focused cardiac ultrasound. The important thing about the point of care clinical ultrasound is about the equipment and the realization that you can do it. And then I'll talk about how to avoid the resistance from the existing diagnostic services. So one uh, few slides about the handheld devices. You can see that you've got a lot of devices in the market, essentially. So are the results are going to be better with this? So obviously, you can do a 2D echocardiography. If you have used one of these devices, you can easily make out that you can use the 2D, you can use the color, but they have a restriction of spectral Doppler, 
and uh, advanced modalities. So essentially, the point of care transthoracic echocardiography is been also labeled as focus limited or a goal directed, or you can say as a rapid assessment in the point of care. It can be done anywhere into the hospital settings, pre-hospital settings, in the ambulance. You can desire you know, even at the home. So obviously, as I said, they are comparable to the standard techniques, standard labs, standard monitors, standard eco machines. So what you can going to miss is basically you can do the advanced study. So you're obviously going to miss out the conditions where the patients have elevated left ventricular pressures, severe valvular disease, and a pulmonary hypertension. So about the handheld devices versus the standard machines, these machines are in experts hand. Despite the lack of the spectral Doppler modalities are highly reliable and valuable screening tools for the structural heart diseases. And then something about that you can do it as an assist, then most of the, I'm going to cut uh, probably one or two papers, and this is the paper which talk about the comparison of medical student versus the cardiologist. And here, the, actually, medical students have a training for six hours, and they've been trained to diagnose. And you can see how much is actually the efficacy of medical students comparison to the cardiologist. So what about the non-cardiologist perform clinical ultrasound? And you can see the TT after cardiovascular physical examination allows improvement in the diagnostic accuracy even when the clinical examination was performed by the cardiologist. I think that's the take home message. That's very important. So what about the non-cardiologist? The high accuracy in the assessment of left ventricular functions and the presence of pericardial effusion in both adult and pediatric critical care patients was more efficacious, more sensitive, on more positive critical in case of non cardiologist So it's essentially basically done by the emergency medicine, uh, emergency medicine physicians. So one thing basically, as I know, then you, you are going to ask me the question, how are you going to avoid this all resistance when you start doing this? So you're going to be asked by the questions by the radiologist, by your cardiologist, by your peer groups, and that's possible. You have to actually start negotiating them and tell them that the uh, more you're going to screen these patients, more you're going to generate the work for them because you're going to find out something. Or that's how actually you have to start doing this. And obviously, you have to find out the way to do ongoing education and research in your department so that you can generate a more efficacy, more paperwork, so that you can establish the, the possibility of doing more work for yourself as well as for your cardiologist. And uh, I think the most important thing is you have to hold the license. I think that is very important. You have to get qualified, you have to get a license. So essentially, my college have a document how one should be guideline about the training and practice and how one should be trained. So that's a guideline from the Austrian and New Zealand College of Anesthesia. And even the critical care from the Austrian and New Zealand College have a guidelines on how one should be trained to use the ultrasonography in the critical care. And that's obviously everybody knows about this National Board of Echocardiography, which is the American Board Certification, which have a basic, advanced, all types of exam in terms of transthoracic transfusion. And then you can see, you have, in la if you see the whole literature for last about 10 years or so, there you see there's a tsunami of ultrasound. You can see ultrasound has been done all over the places, including all possible organs, starting from heart to all the way to the spine. So let's go to the evidence, what's happening with the toe in the intraoperative cardiac surgery. You can see there are 10 prospective observational study. Though it is a zero randomized control, look at the evidence. There is a lot of evidence with a change in the diagnosis and the surgery, and possibly, possibly doubtful outcome, but it's been now established pro-con into the cardiac surgery. So what about the anesthesia and intensive care in terms of hemodynamic monitoring? Look at the number of studies, 29 observational studies with a level B2 evidence with a change in the diagnosis and a change in surgery. Though the literature is suggestive and non-comparative, there's a lot of good evidence there. So what about the transthoracic in anesthesia and critical care? There are 13 prospective observational studies, two randomized controls, and level B2 evidence. And look at the amount of percentage of change in the diagnosis and surgery, 55, 54%. So what we are looking for, change, very practical. Just to be reactive, I think not useful. Yes, we can learn, but what you're looking for is to be proactive. So that's what we are looking for. You have seen the change for last one year, last two years, India, abroad, everywhere. 
So what happened to the preoperative clinic? If you decide to do the same thing in a preoperative clinic, you can see you pick up any five major procedures, patients coming to your pre-admission clinic or a preoperative clinic. One in five, like a serious business I'm talking about. Serious business. So what you're going to see, if you see the literature, they say step up care, 20%, and step down care, 30 So what is the step up care? So that means either you're going to delay the surgery, use the invasive monitor, use the vasopressor, use the ICU, SDU in the post-operative period. That's what we're looking for. So step up and a step down. So what about the emergency surgery done in terms of transthoracic? So evidence is same thing. Step up about 20%, step down around 30%. So emergency, I mean patient is coming directly into your, before your operating theater holding bay, and that's what the emergency surgery is. So what condition? It's a whole thing in literature. So you can actually Google it out, read this. There's a lot of things you can actually diagnose with a fair amount of expertise. You don't need to be a cardiologist to diagnose all these conditions. So what about the outcome? So I'm talking, I know this is mainly non-cardiac CME, so it's most of the anesthetists are being involved in the non-cardiac surgery. So what the outcome like? So if you see the outcome, that's one of the study which we have been involved in the retrospective study done by the Royal Melbourne Hospital, which is we call as an ECONOP study. That's a neck of femur study, which is a high risk population, which is a retrospective, and they found that there's a greatest survival echo group. So what's a retrospective? They have found the patient which had echo group, done echocardiography with the neck of femur surgery, and no echocardiography with the neck of surgery. So that's how they divided, they find out what actually happened. But unfortunately, this study was stopped because the number of patients required was 1,000 patients. So obviously it was not possible because one of the quality indicators was a cognition. And obviously this group is fully biased with the cognition problem. So that's how it's been stopped. So what happened then? So they found that they need to do something, a prospective study. So we designed something called an ECONOP2 study. So what is this? So somebody coming with a neck of femur fracture and they need to be followed for 30 days. So we just completed last month this whole complete study with 100 patients from the eight different centers and then found that these patients actually can be have a better outcome with echocardiography. So what was the conclusion with this study? So still this study is need to be done with a 365 days follow-up, but essentially this pilot study established that the feasibility calibrated with the primary outcome and showed sufficient group separation for having the focused cardiac ultrasound and support the large case, which is going to be happen soon. So do you think it's a great change? Yes. So what about the other 50 persons? Are they healthy? They are still breathless. So does there need anything to be done? Look at the lung ultrasounds, number of publications, starting with the 40 publications in 1985, and now in 2016, we got a f almost 150 publications. So what we can diagnose? Pneumothorax, consolidation, consolidation with the pleural effusion. Yes, so how many patients? Look at this study. It's been labeled by the Daniel Ditch instance under the blue protocol. So what they've done with a lung ultrasound, they studied 2,000 patients, and they compared their diagnosis, sensitivity, and specificity with a CT, with a known patient with asthma and a COPD. And they found the various diagnoses of asthma, polymembolism, pneumothorax, and a consolidation. So wh what about the routine all admissions who have a transthoracic and a lung ultrasound in the medical IC? You can see the, the number of conditions diagnosed on the screen in terms of consolidation and interstitial syndromes. And they found that the, there is a 40% step up and about 15% step down treatment change in the plan. So what about the cardiac surgery? So, so this is the same thing come from the Royal Melbourne group. So what they've done is actually they screen all the patients in the post-operative cardiac surgical patients to find out whether that can be helped. So you can see the step up is around 40%. They found 33% have pleural effusions, pneumothorax, consolidation, acute pulmonary edema. Step down, 15%. So basically pleural effusion and consolidation in a smaller amount. Look at the lung ultrasound in the ward. Look at the comparison with the clinical ultrasound, chest x-ray, and a both together. And ultrasound, almost 95%. So you're just missing 5% compared to the clinical and chest x-ray examination. So what about the, this is a, just a survey done in 2012 compared to 2015. And look at the amount of actually people appreciated in the peri-anesthetic practice and the huge appreciation and a practice in the daily clinical practice. 
So what about the vascular pact? We do day in and day out. So what's the evidence? So there is only one possibly uh, goes against is a peripheral vein cannulation under ultrasound. Otherwise, they all are A1 and only except pick line, that is a B2. All are actually labeled as A1. So this is highly recommended. So that's what I actually see. It's not rocket science, carotid on the left side, IGV on the right side, collapsible, essentially. So what you don't want to see, this is what you don't want to see. It's a full lab crap. You can see this is a patient with a fully aspirin, plavix, and somebody student trying to cannulate with a blind cannulation. It's a huge hematoma. On the right side of the screen, you can see the big hematoma on the right side on the ultrasound. So nice guidelines. What they've done, 2,000 recommendations. They studied before and after. So almost about 500 patients, and they found there is a reduction in the complication by 50%. Cochrane review. So what they found? Increase overall success rate, decrease overall complication rate. But in experience, they are not sure. Probably they are going to have another study and look for it. So yes, it's a good success. Regional anesthesia, two meta-analysis, 23 randomized control. So what they say? More efficient, less serious complication, better analysis here. Probably not demonstrated. Both are equivocal. However, because of this, they found that there is a rapid advancement of acute and chronic pain specialties. So essentially, I think it as a tip of icebergs. It's going to go long, long way. It's going to spread all over possible. And we are going to see the ultrasound being used by everybody, all specialties, interns, paramedics, everybody. So this is how the experience of uh, pyramid has been described. So you can see starting point on the left side of the screen. And as you grow up, that's on the top is your teacher's supervisors. So on the bottom line, what been taught actually is the acquisition of images. And the more important is the pattern recognition. Pattern recognition. So that's how you've been trained in the most of the workshops or hands-on training. And that's how you grow up on the, as a star, as a teacher and a supervisors. So how one should we get trained? So that's the question. I'm already in practice. I pass out long back. I'm in practice for five years, 10 years, impossible. So training is must, so you have to find out the way. So other way to find out is apprenticeship model, which is possibly not possible for a big scale. But somebody actually, what does it mean actually go and see and visit the centers and work with the best of the expertise? So it is not possible with a lot many people. So obviously, having said that, what is important is education is important, examination is important, and regulatory bodies are important. So what's next? Period situations? Yes. So what it does, it causes, it actually identifies all the reversible causes in non-shockable rhythm of pulseless electrical activity versus a system, and avoid the futile poor outcome. So what it says, basically you got a window of opportunity called as a 10 second pulse check, and that's probably you have to pick up a time, I call it the brevity of opportunity, where you actually can pick up an ultrasound and go and find out the causes. So that's a, one of the field protocol, focus echocardiography in emergency life support protocol, which talk about how one should be doing uh, ultrasonography or echocardiography in arrest situations. So what you essentially can diagnose, you can diagnose possible causes of hypoxia related to the lung, hypovolemia, thrombosis, whether it's a coronary or pulmonary, uh, tamponar, and a tension pneumothorax. So what else you can do? Ultrasound airway. So whichever technique you want to use, yes. So what about the lung isolation and double lumen tip in cardiothoracic anesthesia or thoracic anesthesia? So essentially what you're looking for is absence of lung sliding and the presence of lung pulse seen in the, on the side of surgery and a lung sliding sign seen on the opposite side. That's what they're talking about, the technique used for ultrasound in a double lumen tube lung isolation surgery. But what you need is a routine screening. It's very subjective. But you cannot rule out the tube advancement, particularly during the procedure, because the patient has already been on the lateral side, so it's impossible. And if you need airtight situations, then probably what you need is a bronchoscopy anyway. So a couple of slides about diaphragm. So yes, diaphragm is diaphragm ultrasound. What you can do is basically you can find out all the diaphragmatic movement, diaphragmatic dysfunction, its thickness. And the last is a gastric ultrasound. So I don't know how many are doing a gastric ultrasound, but that's how it actually been. So on the left side of the screen, actually you can see the empty stomach, and on the right side of the stomach, on the right side of the screen, top and bottom, you can see the actually the patient who has given a uh, what you call as a aerated solution, and on the other side, top bottom with the food. So what is happening in the uh, 
So what's the really advantage? So I just brief whatever I told you. The most important thing is you have to remember this is a feasible resources are available. When it's possible to have access to the chest, it is easily done. You can repeat it. It's a non-invasive. And if you make it as appropriately managed, then you can use as a hemodynamic monitoring. So what's the disadvantage? As I said, you need expertise, you need a training, and the, probably the most disaster is a wrong interpretation and a diagnosis. So you need ongoing education about this technology. So I'll say this is a rise of machines for the last 10, 15 years. It's a disruptive medicine. You are going to disrupt everybody. You're going to annoy the people. You're going to annoy the surgeons, radiologists, cardiologists, everybody. So this has been labeled as a disruptive medicine. So it's been, also you can use in a clinical examination. So you can label this ultrasound guided clinical examination, ultrasound guided procedures, ultrasound as a part of the medical training, medical education. So should we perform echocardiography on all our patients? Probably there is not much evidence. So what's the, what the literature says? Possibly it says a small increase in the 30 day, one year mortality and a length of stay. And there is no benefit in the preoperative medical consultation performed by the internal medicine based physician before major non-cardiac surgery. And possibly it delays otherwise urgent and a cancer surgery which could also unnecessarily harm the patients. And the last, routine echocardiography in the perioperative period probably doesn't create a high quality data. So routine, so when one should be doing a routine, peri uh, routine perioperative echocardiography? So somebody with a cardiovascular disease and who need cardiovascular anotropic and a mechanical support, a major vascular surgery, surgeries with anticipated major hemodynamic and fluid changes. A conventional anesthetic monitoring does not answer your clinical questions. That's possibly four or five indication where you should be doing a routine clinical ultrasound. And that's what you're looking for. Everything at one center, one place, you don't have to move the patient. So one on the one roof. So summary, so that's what you're looking. So somebody with not a stethoscope, but with the ultrasound. So what did it mean? There is always improvement in the education. The transducers are getting smaller and smaller. Most of the equipments are affordable, easily available. And clinical ultrasound will or can be new standard monitoring in anesthesia practice. Thank you.